Hi, everybody. My name is TJ Blakeman. I'm the president of the Champaign County History Museum, and I want to welcome you all back to our reboot of our History Talk series. Uh, we took a little bit of a hiatus. Obviously, 2020 has been a challenging year for everybody, uh, but we're finally getting back into the swing of things, and uh, we're proud to start this off with an interesting talk about the uh, senior memorial chimes at Altgeld Hall. And uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, we are not doing a webinar, we're doing an actual kind of Zoom meeting. So you'll all get to interact uh, with our speaker, Liam Flood, at the end of the discussion. But while he's speaking, I would just ask that everyone make sure to keep your mics muted. Uh, if you wanna turn your video on, that's fine. If you don't, you can mute your video as well. Uh, and save that until the end of our talk. But um, the presentation should be about 45 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll reserve about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, real quickly, for those of you who are new to a program here at the Champaign County History Museum, I just wanna say welcome. Um, we are, you can find a lot more about the museum by visiting us online at www.champaigncountyhistory.org. Um, we would love for you to be a member. Uh, if, you'd if you like this program and you'd like to see more programs like this and you would like to leave a, a one-time donation, I'll leave some links in the chat uh, towards the end of the meeting so you can do that as well. But we'd love to have you join our museum family uh, as a yearly member as well. So today we're excited to welcome uh, Liam Flood. Liam is a recent graduate at the University of Illinois, graduated in 2020 in chemical engineering. Um, but in 2018, he became, had the official designation as, as chimes player um, at the, uh, at Altgeld Hall. And um, he loved this position so much that he decided to dive into the actual history of it. And so he has, been compiling this um, wonderful history of these chimes, trying to uncover as much untold story as possible. Um, I think he'd like to ultimately publish this um, so we can look forward to something in the future. But he currently now lives in Washington, DC. So our speaker is coming to us all the way from, uh, from Washington and he's there working uh, for Capital One. He's also decided to take his uh, talents, to further his talents, and uh, is, is attending the North American Carillon School, which I'm sure he'll maybe describe the difference between a chime and a carillon uh, in this presentation as well. But um, we're so glad to have him uh, to come back and to, to be a former student that's continuing to provide our community with this kind of wonderful information. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Liam. Thank you very much for the introduction, TJ. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll uh, reiterate what you said. I've been working on this history for about 13 months now. Um, I got the idea in January of last year um, and the pandemic actually made it incredibly easy to work on it because, you know, from March to September, I had nothing to do all day. So I was able to dedicate so much time uh, to digging into this really rich history. Um, so I'm really glad to be able to share it with you all today. So let me share my screen and let's get started. Let me know if any of you cannot see this. Um, and if no one says anything, I'll, I'll just go right ahead. So I titled this presentation, A Brief History of the Senior Memorial Chime. It's 45 minutes, but you could easily go on this topic for hours. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep it as succinct as possible, but also pretty informative. Let's ignore the copyright stuff. So let's try a video here. I'm hoping this works. Um, because the best way to explain how the chime works is to show you all a video of it actually happening. So give me a second while YouTube is being really difficult. And then
We'll see if this works. But this is a video of me playing the Adams Family theme song um, during Halloween of 2019. So you can see that it's quite the um, difficult process to play on that instrument. You have to be bouncing up and down this super wide keyboard, slamming down on these massive pedals uh, with your whole body weight, um, just to play even simple tunes. Um, you guys can all see this, the uh, presentation, right? Okay. So um, to explain what you just saw in words, the way that ringing the Altgeld chimes works is there is this large wooden keyboard, which we call a chime stand that contains 15 pump handles, these massive wooden levers. Um, and when you press down on these pump handles, there is a galvanized steel aircraft cable attached to each one. And it travels nearly 70 feet up through this empty space in the tower in the middle goes through that floor and then all the way to the third picture, it's attached to this little ball on a stick called a clapper. That clapper sits about an inch away from the edge of the bell at all times. And when you press down on the lever, uh, the string pulls it into contact with the lip of the bell. And then the bell vibrates and makes the sound that you hear. Um, so, the Altgeld chimes have the official, official name of the senior memorial chime. And we need to briefly explain what a senior memorial is at the University of Illinois. It was this um, since discontinued process of a class when they would graduate, they would purchase something for the university and leave it behind um, to memorialize their class and the, uh, the experience that they had at the university. Um, it's not really a thing anymore ever since Alma Mater was, uh, was constructed in 1929. That was one of the last big senior memorials in the style that we're talking about. Um, and one of the most famous along with the Altgeld chimes themselves. And there are a handful of other senior memorials on campus today that you may or may not have seen such as the uh, clock on the Illini Union class of 1878 the lamp in front of Altgeld Hall is a class of 1905, and the Eternal Flame bench is the class of 1912. So in 1914, the class of 1914 had a serious problem. They could not agree on what senior, senior memorial they would buy for uh, the university. Um, there were a lot of ideas floated around. Some of the big ones were a bust of Abraham Lincoln. And this was before the bust of Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln Hall was a thing. An electronic scoreboard for uh, Illinois Field. Um, but the most interesting proposition was one made by Pete Darty, who was editor of the Daily Illini and a senior of the class of 1914. He suggested that, the, that his class buy a chime something that was in, extremely expensive, um, not something that their class could do on their own, but he believed that it should happen. And he was very likely influenced by um, exactly what took place at 
Ohio State University, the classes of 1906 to 1914 pooled their money together and purchased a chime for the university. And so it was recently built by then. And I have reason to believe that he heard about it and was like, wait a second, why can't Illinois do the same thing? And so he used his influence as editor of the Daily Illini to sway public opinion in his favor. Um, a lot of students accused him of cherry picking information, falsifying interviews, and silencing his opponents on the issue. But in March of 1914, there was a vote put up and the chimes won. 299 seniors voted for the chimes to be the official memorial of their class. And this would be a binding vote in that um, if a memorial got a majority of votes, everyone would be directing all their resources towards making it a reality. Um, the Lincoln bus was second. And so for those people who voted for it, they eventually got what they wanted um, because there is a Lincoln bus on campus now. And it's important to point out the um, contributions of women at the time because the vote for the chime among women was nearly unanimous. And if there had not been such a uh, united front among women for the chime vote, we probably would not have this instrument on campus today. So Pete got what he want. They voted for a chime. What are you supposed to do now? It's still way too expensive. How, what are the logistics of forcing classes of students that aren't even in college yet to participate? Um, there was no direction for some time, but uh, eventually a local banker in Champaign named Hazen Selwyn Capron, um, he wrote a letter to the Daily Illini um, with a proposal for how to pull off this project. So he suggested that the classes of 1914 to 1919 all raise $1,000 during their senior years. And, you know, I don't remember this figure off the top of my head, but that's, I think, $20,000 in today's money equivalent. So a serious amount of cash uh, you would have to raise during your senior year. And then you would deposit that money with Mr. Capron at the First National Bank of Champaign. Um, and he would invest that money in building and loan associations and uh, you know, it would earn a little bit of interest. So by 1919, the six contributions plus the interest earned would net you about $7,500. And then once that milestone is reached, the classes of 1920 and 1921 would contribute their $1,000 early and you would have nearly $10,000 and you could buy yourself uh, a chime. And so since the, student, the students had no alternative, they immediately accepted his plan and got to work. Um, and so we're gonna grossly oversimplify the next six years because it's a super long story with a lot of stuff to talk about and um, that would really explode the length of this presentation. So. I'm going to summarize it in this in this graph here. You can see that the class of 1914 proved right away that you could raise $1,000. So Mr. Capron's plan was definitely reasonable. But immediately after that, for almost every year after that, none of the classes were able to meet that $1,000 quota. And we can attribute that failure to um, World War I and the influenza pandemic in 1918 and 1919, the first of two pandemics that found itself in the Chimes history. Um, World War I was really devastating for student life on campus. Students were getting ripped out of their classes each day, um, particularly the committees that were supposed to raise money for this Chime project were barely able to hold themselves together. Um, there are notable examples of the figurehead of these committees getting ripped away to France for war. So it was very difficult to raise money on this time, um, especially in 1918 when there was a pandemic ravaging the country, the world, and 
campus, also the campus. But you see in 1920 and in 1921, they really picked up the slack from the previous years. And we can attribute that to um, the leader of the committees in that year, Victor Cullen, uh, for electrifying the drive to finish this project. And then we have this orange bar, um, which is abbreviated the USSMA. And I want to explain what that is. That is the United States School of Military Aeronautics, which was the military installation on campus during World War I. Um, despite the name School of Military Aeronautics, they didn't actually train pilots. Um, I don't exactly remember what the purpose of it was, um, but it had quite substantially large classes in the time that it was on campus. And um, it, their involvement has to do with the tail end of fundraising. So by 1920 in the spring, the, uh, the Chime Fund, as it was called, had nearly $11,000 uh, available. And so the, uh, the university partnered with the students at the time to select a bell foundry to cast some bells. And they eventually settled on the McShane Bell Foundry Company of Baltimore, Maryland. And they had, with the $11,000 they had, it was enough to purchase a 13 bell chime. Uh, but in the moment that they were going to solidify this deal, the Dean of Men at the time, Thomas Arkell Clark, he wondered if this configuration of bells could play the melody of Illinois loyalty. Um, it turns out that answer was no. 13 bells was not enough. You needed two more uh, to play the song perfectly. And so he blocked the purchase from taking place. He said, there's no way that we could possibly do this because we've been fantasizing for years about hearing this song on this instrument. Um, but he was very quick to come up with a solution. He knew that the United States School of Military Aeronautics had a leftover recreation fund totaling about $3,000. Um, in 1920, the school did not exist on campus anymore. So this fund was doing nothing except sitting there. And he convinced the president of the university, David Kinley, to ask the board of trustees to allow this money to be used for the chime. And they agreed on the condition that the largest bell would be dedicated to former president, Dr. Edmund J. James, and the second largest bell would be dedicated to the School of Military Aeronautics. And so that is the case. And uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, sheet music, the uh, orange note is the one dedicated to the US school. Um, it sounds an E on the keyboard. So why did, why did these bells end up in Altgeld Hall? Why did we not build a separate tower? University Hall was a building that existed at the time and they also had a tower. You could have easily built a tower on any building and put the bells in there. So why did we pick that one? Well, it was a super easy option because it was the minimal amount of effort involved. Um, Altgeld Hall, had this really beautiful Romanesque tower. Um, and it was specifically designed to hold bells. And I have here a quote from the board of trustees in 1896, where they say specifically that uh, the architects are instructed to make sure the tower is able to hold a chime of bells and that whoever whatever reputable citizen from the state of Illinois first donates a significant quantity of money to purchase a chime, will have that chime named after him. Um, there, was no one, there was no one reputable citizen from the state of Illinois who had a majority donation. So the chime was not named after one specific person, but rather the senior classes that contributed to it. And um, there was actually a plan to hang the bells in a tower other than Altgeld Hall, because around this time, there was a plan to build a freestanding bell tower, which you can see on this slide. Um, but it never came to fruition, um, and it, it failed multiple times until finally succeeding in 
2008 with the McFarland Carillon on, uh, on the South Quad. So the bells were installed in Altgeld Hall instead. So 1920 was a huge year for the university, specifically homecoming, because it was the 10th homecoming celebration, but it was also a celebration of the end of the flu pandemic, the end of World War I, and to top it all off, the successful realization of the Altgeld Chimes and a 17 to seven victory against the University of Minnesota in the, according to the Daily Illini, hottest hardest fought battle on Illinois field in university history. Um, the dedication of the chime took place on October 30th, 1920 at 10 a.m. That was on a Saturday before the uh, football game versus University of Minnesota. Um, it was a small ceremony. However, an incredible amount of people showed up. If you look closely in this picture, the sea of heads goes forever, all the way to the background of cars. Um, it's the most people ever gathered for a chime concert in the history of that instrument. I can tell you that. Um, and so it had, a, it had a little quaint ceremony. Victor Cullen, the guy who, the student who electrified the campaign in 1920, picked up all the slack from the delayed fundraising, um, gave a short description of the history of the project uh, thus far, uh, trustee from the university accepted the chimes. We got a speech from David Kinley where he was quoted saying, no elaborate ceremony could express our appreciation of the grandeur of this idea so, sp so splendidly carried out. Um, and then there was an inaugural chime concert by an employee of the McShane Bell Foundry Company, Milton Harry Matty, um, because by then there was no no one else knew how to play the instrument. So they had, a, they had an employee play it. And um, the star of this ceremony was playing Illinois loyalty on the bells for the first time. So at the same time of this whole installation process taking place and the dedication, um, the juniors, had to decide their senior memorial because the chime project was done. So they couldn't, you know, they couldn't just add their money to the pile. There was already a chime that was existent. So they chose for their senior memorial to be a clock, specifically a pendulum clock from the Seth Thomas Clock Company that would ring out the Westminster quarters on the chimes. You know that famous clock sound, you know, bing bong, bing bong. Um, it was led by Robert Gale Thompson, who was chairman of the committee to raise money for it. Um, and funnily enough, it quickly became a super unpopular gift because back then there were not many loud cars, there were not many tall buildings, and this clock ran 24 seven, 365. Uh, so in the middle of the night, you would hear this huge, loud ringing um, every 15 minutes from Altgeld Hall. People did not like that. Uh, and it did not get electrified until the 1950s. And so it rang every 15 minutes straight uh, from the 1920s to the 1950s. There were a lot of people that complained in the newspapers about it. Um, and I have a little, uh, a little timeline at the bottom. Uh, this is typically the timeline that senior memorials would have taken um, over the course of one uh, school year. The last component of this, of this memorial is a tablet that's 10 feet by two and a half feet and explains the three inscriptions that are written on the three largest bells of the chime. It also has a statement from the class of 1922 about their clock. It was manufactured by the Gorham Manufacturing Company of New York City, a pretty famous company, according to Wikipedia at least. Um, and they used the leftover money from the Chime Fund to, uh, to purchase this. And it's installed on the north side of Altgeld Hall Tower. Um, so if you ever find yourself walking past it, you should uh, take a step back and, uh, and read it. 
So let's talk about some of the early chimes players of the, of the Altgeld chimes. Uh, this is where things get uh, pretty interesting, at least in my opinion. So the, the first chimes player was John William Arnold, and he uh, is what we would now call chimes master in that he was the head player responsible for making sure that the instrument is wrong and training other people. He had about a team of five people at all times. Um, and we have his music luckily because of uh, someone that we'll talk about in a second. Raymond Francis Dvorak was the second chimes master of the Altgeld chimes. And he was quite the famous individual because he was the uh, band director at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1934 to 68. Um, he, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. We'll continue. Gilbert Rubin Dayton uh, studied how to play the chime under Raymond Francis Dvorak. Um, and he's actually the fa my favorite person that I've discovered so far because he was quite the jokester. Wrote a lot of uh, poems that are supposed to be funny at the time that he wrote them. I, they're definitely not funny now because I don't understand them. Um, was really involved in the satirical newspaper column, the Campus Scout in the Daily Illini. So uh, quite the jokester. Um, and we only have one of his arrangements left uh, surviving to the present day. Then we have Alice Loretta Madden, who uh, was later married and changed her name to Harter. She was the first female, first woman to play the chimes at all. Um, in the first 10, 15 years of the chime being a thing, um, they were managed by the band director, Albert Austin Harding. And he did not believe women had the physical strength to play the chime so they were not considered eligible to apply to play. But somehow, we don't really know how, she convinced um, those who were responsible for the chime to let her play. Um, and her music has survived to the present day um, thanks to her husband. Um, after she died in 1997, her husband donated the music to uh, Sue Wood, who was the chimes master at the time. and. Uh, those are preserved now in the uh, university archives. So in the next 15 years of the chimes history, things start to get a little fuzzy. Um, the chime lost its, um, it lost its specialness. Um, there's a word that I'm thinking of that I, I can't remember right now, but people stopped caring so much about exactly what was taking place with the chime. It, it kind of settled into the normal life of the university. Um, so details get a little fuzzy around here. We have um, Charles McKinley Seldomridge, who was a very, very important chimes master of the, uh, of the chimes because he's a gold star Illini. Um, he unfortunately died as a prisoner of war in World War II, um, but he was very famous in the campus community while at, uh, while at the University of Illinois. He was a drama and music virtuoso, starred in a lot of campus plays, uh, played a number of instruments, was the chimes master of the Alkel chimes, which is a notable, uh, notable position by itself, and uh, was the co-star of something that he started, which was uh, chimes organ duets that were broadcast on the university radio station, uh, W-I-L-L. Unfortunately, I can't find any recordings of these right now, but I, you know, hopefully one day something will turn up. Uh, so here we, next we got John Elwin Green, who's Chimes Master in uh, 42. Uh, he was appointed the position by the director of the School of Music after the person before him was drafted into World War II. And he only served for a year because after that, he himself was drafted into World War II. Um, he returned to the university, but I'm not really sure his involvement afterwards. Um, but he led a successful life uh, in academia and as a band director. Um, and we uh, know about his involvement in the Chimes because of his memoirs, The Many Shades of Green. 
We got Kenneth Raymond Moore, who was Chimes Master after him in 46, 48. Um, music survived to the present day, a very old and beaten notebook, uh, very difficult to read, but we still have his music, which is pretty cool. And then we have Russell Oris Pugh, who was uh, probably the last Chimes Master before the instrument's total disrepair uh, in the 50s. And uh, he led a successful academic career in music uh, himself. So I mentioned just a second ago that the chime really fell apart in the 50s. Um, these, the parts that were, that made up the chime, the very specialized parts, particularly the parts of the clock uh, from the class of 1922, you know, they didn't just sell them anywhere. Um, and so that, that is the justification that the university gave for its very poor condition 30 years after uh, building it, after installing it, because they found it very difficult to buy replacement parts. Um, and so in the 50s, it really fell apart to the point where the School of Music said, we can't be using this anymore. Um, and it fell silent for quite a long time. Uh, the University of Illinois Foundation, though, they decided that they, for one of the one of the funds that they were going to use to raise money was going to go directly towards repairing the Altgeld chimes. Uh, that was created in, in December of 1953. It was originally going to be, um, or it was originally started in 1951, but they had to postpone it. Um, by 1956, they uh, convinced the McShane Bell Foundry Company to repair both the chime and the clock for six grand. Um, and they had about um, $4,500 at the time. So they successfully convinced the board of trustees to designate about $1,200 from state funds to cover the remaining balance. Um, and a very important quote from President Henry's proposal was in, in accepting the chimes, the university obligated itself to maintain them. Yes, they certainly did. That is mine. That is an unchangeable opinion of mine, and I, I think it's very important to point that out. Um, some of the most recent discoveries that I've made on this front is that um, there was something, there was a, uh, a graduate from the 30s around this time. His name was uh, Andrew Roland Staley. He wanted to donate a considerable amount of money so that the university could purchase a Schulmerreich Carillon Americana, which is an imitation bell instrument. Um, not a real chime or a real carillon, um, but he wanted, to, wanted the university to have one. And the University of Illinois Foundation very much so would, wanted to accept that money. Um, and so they, they diverted the Altgeld Chimes Restoration Project to, you know what, let's use, let's use this money and buy this, this imitation bell instrument. And that's when Victor Cullen shows up a second time. This time he's about 60. And he writes to the University of Illinois Foundation saying, I swear you will not be using this money to buy this instrument. You will be repairing the Altgeld chimes with this money that you solicited these donations for. Um, and made some vague threat about uh, publishing something nasty about the University of Illinois Foundation if they use this money in a way that they didn't advertise when fundraising. Um, so the project eventually switched back to, we're gonna repair the Altgeld chimes. And so they did. And then we have this man show up in the history, Albert Emmett Marion, uh, who was known by students as Mr. Marion. Um, after the chime was officially done with renovations in 1956, uh, Mr. Marion shows up in 1958. He was a faculty member uh, for about 10 years before he goes to the director of the School of Music, revealing that he has some experience playing carillon-like instruments. Uh, he learned how to play the electric carillon at Barra College in Georgia. Um, and so he, he said to the director at the time, Director Brannigan, 
that he knows how to play this and that he would like to play it if he could. And since there was no one playing at the time, director Brannigan said, sure, go ahead. You can be the Chimes Master now and uh, sent him off. And so Al started playing, you know, one or two concerts a week. Um, he eventually convinced his, the department to award two graduate assistantships. Um, those eventually dissolved about one or two years later. And so he switched to recruiting student volunteers. Um, he was an incredibly important figure in the history of the Chime, serving nearly, what is that, three decades? I can't do rapid math like that, but many, 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 many years of volunteer service to this instrument, trained generations of people uh, to play this instrument, inspired the drive to pursue music among a number of people, um, and fun fact was the driving force behind the existence of the McFarland Carillon on the South Quad. Um, so here I'm just gonna give an aside. The difference between a carillon and a chime rests entirely with the number of bells. Carillons have 23 or more bells and chimes have 22 or fewer. Both are played with some type of keyboard. Um, and Al was quite frustrated with, uh, with the limited range of the Altgeld chimes. There were only 15 bells, and so you were limited to playing simple melodies with even simpler harmonies attached to it. Um, and he really wanted the university to have a carillon because there were a lot of other big name universities by this time that did have a carillon, um, like the University of Kansas, the University of Michigan, the University of Wisconsin. Um, they all had carillons and there was a distinct carillon art uh, around this time developing that was independent from the history of chimes uh, in North America. And he believed that the university should have one of their own. And so he personally started the drive from scratch. He established a fund with the University of Illinois Foundation, called it the Carillon Upgrade Project, personally solicited funds from people, advertised all over wherever he could that he was on a campaign to to bring a carillon to campus. He wanted to upgrade the chimes specifically uh, to reduce the cost because we already had quite, you know, 15 bells that were quite big. Um, but unfortunately his project was not realized before he died in 2002, um, especially because in 1990, he raised the $500,000 necessary to purchase 49 bells and, or to purchase 34 bells and refurbish the existing 15. But it was determined that Altgeld Hall would, Altgeld Hall Tower would collapse under the weight of the additional bells. And something else about the science of uh, sound would, it would just disrupt the, you know, the integrity of the tower, these new bells, it just wasn't feasible. Um, so they would have to be installed elsewhere um, which would nearly triple the cost of the Carillon as a whole to have to build a separate structure for it. Uh, so this is where Mr. Dick McFarland comes in, graduate in 52. He donated $1.5 million, basically the entire cost of the tower uh, that the Carillon now sits in and uh, in memory of his wife, Sarah McFarland, who died of ovarian cancer in 2003. So the, uh, this beautiful looking carillon, which was completed in 2008, but dedicated in 2010, um, is now on the South Quad of campus and uh, is named the Sarah Sally McFarland Memorial Carillon. Um, unfortunately, this is a computerized electric carillon there is nowhere that you can play it manually. Um, I hold the opinion that Mr. Marion would be very upset rolling in his grave at what took place because you know he specifically wanted to be able to play this carillon. Um, and so it's limited to uh, a computer being able to play it. And Sue Wood, who we're gonna talk about in a quick second was also very much so dissatisfied with the results of this project. Um, and the most recent estimate is that it would cost another half million dollars to convert this to a manual carillon, 
which is something that is very much so desired among people who like bell instruments. Computerized carillons, not good. Let's talk about Sue Wood. Um, she is arguably the second most important person in the history of chimes players, right behind Albert Marion. She served, uh, she volunteered her time for just as long, if not longer than Mr. Marion, um, joined in 1971 and was promoted to chimes master in 1994 when Mr. Marion stepped down and served in that role all the way until she stepped down herself in 2017. Um, she is the second woman chimes master in the history of the instrument. And um, just like Mr. Marion inspired literal generations of people to, to enjoy music and to play this really unique instrument and maintain this tradition. Um, and her most significant contribution is that she contributed over 200 arrangements of music to the library of the, in of, of, of the instrument. And so her music is very prevalent and rings out basically every day. Someone, anyone who plays the chime knows a song written by Sue Wood and probably plays it often. Um, and she has been quoted with a really lovely quote, music is the thing that makes life worth living. Another big moment in the history of the chime was the establishment of the RSO, uh, which stands for Registered Student Organization. Um, so the, the students formally organized in 2015 uh, under a common goal, instead of it just being, you know, this, this tradition maintained by, um, by these people um, informally. Um, Amy Liu is the founder and first treasurer of the RSO and Griffin Jenkins was the first president. And uh, since the RSO has existed, there have been a lot more organized and sophisticated events uh, involving the Altgeld chimes. Before it was, you know, it was mostly just someone goes up, plays a concert and that's it. Um, but, you know, in, in 2015, the Altgeld ringers hosted a jukebox where members of the community could pay one or two bucks and play a song from the chime on demand, like a jukebox. Um, a lot more formal events were being hosted. Like in 2017, there was a formal concert for the 150th anniversary of the university. There was a memorial for Sue Wood. Um, in 2020 and 2021, which is still going on, there's a, a concert series dedicated to um, increasing awareness of BIPOC music. BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, for anyone who's not familiar with that acronym. Um, and so, you know, this is like, this was a really important moment in the history of the chime because now the students were able to raise money for this instrument, spend some money on more sophisticated events, and uh, unite together to spread awareness of the instrument and honor its history. And we have some fun images of, um, of some gatherings here on the side. The chime was renovated a second time in 2017 and in 2018. Um, in the months prior to this, it was accompanied with quite a bit of drama, which I won't get into, but if you are curious, um, you just got to search um, chimes on the Daily Illini and you can get the gist of, of what took place. But um, it was, this renovation was triggered by the tower's failing grade during fire safety and ADA compliance tests. Obviously, the room in which you play this instrument is over a hundred years old and it was originally a closet. So there's no way that it was going to pass these tests regardless. Um, so it was, it was natural that it failed. Um, and so this in this renovation was centered around safety updates um, for the room in which you play the chimes, as well as some much needed quality of life improvements uh, of the instrument itself. For example, you can see here the keyboard was completely refurbished by the uh, university's furniture shop. It looks beautiful now, less, doesn't make as nearly as much noise as it used to, got a new fresh coat of paint, 
the and stain the the pieces of wood that really needed to go were replaced. Um, the keyboard in the background too, the practice instrument is also looking brand spanking new. Um, and the bells, they were, the mechanisms to ring the bells were, a lot of the parts were replaced um, and cleaned. So it was, it was a well needed renovation. Um, some other important things that took place was the School of Music formally assumed administrative oversight over the instrument because for decades under Albert Marion and Sue Woods tenure, it was just kind of forgotten who was supposed to be, who was accountable for this instrument. And so the School of Music formally took accountability, which was very important. Um, and the position of transmaster is now an official university position that does uh, have the nice benefit of coming with a small salary, pretty cool. Um, and this renovation was considered precursor work to the third renovation that um, is soon to be underway. And this renovation is part of the much, much larger uh, dual renovation of Altgeld Hall, the whole building and Illini Hall. Um, so for any of you that haven't been keeping up on this, um, it's a five year long project that started last year. Uh, phase one is focuses on the exterior of Altgeld Hall. Um, and then there's about a year break where the inside of Altgeld Hall is gonna be entirely evacuated. And then the second phase is another two years in which the building from the inside will be renovated. Uh, so the chime is expected to close to human players sometime this year, maybe actually in 2023, it's not ex entirely known, um, but it will definitely be falling silent during phase two. Uh, because one of the main one of the main points of of interest in this renovation is that the room in which you play the chimes will be completely gutted and uh, renovated, and the floor on which these bells sit at the top of the tower will also be replaced. So you certainly can't be playing the bells during that time. Um, the current chimes master Tina Horton and I we led the donation of all of the papers and historical artifacts in the chime room to the Sousa archives. And if you are curious about what's there and what's available, you can contact them and see specifically the record series 1259. Um, and, the, uh, and the chimes master, Tina Horton and her assistant, Michael Broussard, who I believe is actually in this call right now, um, they are discussing plans to ensure that the RSO survives through this renovation and that the chime uh, will be able to ring quickly and efficiently when the building reopens in 2025. And I have here the same quote from President Henry in 1956. Um, in accepting the chimes, the university obligated itself to maintain them. And uh, he still is right. And I'm very much so glad to see the university uh, ensure that the chime doesn't take a back seat in this renovation and that things will, things will be good for the future. Yes, this was really brief. It, I really was droning on for a long time, uh, but this really was as succinctly as I could possibly give this presentation. Um, it really is just tip of the iceberg. I, like I said before, I could go on about this for hours um, and I certainly will in the publication that I hope to produce in the not too distant future. I have a quick gallery of images that I'd like to show you all um, through my search for long lost pictures. Here we have uh, Mr. Mary in 1963. I really don't understand why the cape is a thing, but this is one of multiple images of him in a cape. Um, still trying to figure out what the deal is there, but he does look a lot like a superhero uh, when he plays the chime. So the cape is fitting. Uh, and there he is again in 1976, um, looking dapper in his suit. Here we have Sue Wood in 1981. One of the only pictures that I have of her looking really young um, with not white hair, for example. Um, most of the pictures are in the later years of her life. So this is, this is a pretty rare find. Uh, and this is her in 2014 giving a tour. This is a very, very, very historic photo. Um, 
It's a picture of the chime bells before they were installed in October of 2020. And the man posing behind them is Dr. Edmund J. James. And that big bell on the far left, that is dedicated in his name. Here's a close up of the bells hanging in their structure. Uh, this was taken in 2015 before the, uh, before the structure itself was renovated. So you can see the, the, the aging wood. That is the original pieces of wood. And I believe they still are originals uh, in 2020. Um, and then you can see the changes they made, you know, cleaned the bells a bit, painted the wood, et cetera. This is, uh, we already saw this, this comparison, but I thought I would show it again, larger. These are the, the chime stands in 2010 and 2018. Here are some pictures of chimes players. This is uh, John Alwyn Green, who we talked about earlier, the chimes master in the 40s. Uh, this is Kyle Rhodes posing in the Belfry in 2007. He was a chimes player. And then these are uh, chimes players and also my good friends, Jared Fox and Daniel Marks, who uh, played the chimes with me around the same time. This is uh, me and Daniel Marks practicing 99 Luftballons by Nina uh, for the 99th anniversary concert of the, of the instrument. It was, it was quite a fun performance that was. This is a very rare picture. We have three chimes masters in one photo. Uh, we got Sue Wood on the right, Jonathan Smith, who is also on this call, I believe, on the left, who was the chimes master after her, and uh, Tina Horton in the back, who is the uh, third chimes, or who who's the chimes master after us, after Jonathan. She's the third woman chimes master and the first uh, chimes master who identifies as a person of color. Very important milestones in the diversity of the instrument. Here's another very historic photo of uh, President Edmund J. James posing next to the bell dedicated in his name. Not really sure why he looks so upset um, given that he was just gifted a memorial, but you know. And uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening to me. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you so much, Liam. Um, now let's uh, open it up for questions. And um, I don't have any in the chat just yet. Why don't you please, if you have a question, type that in the chat and then I'll relay it so everyone can hear. But I'm gonna kick it off with a question that I have. And, and that is, um, what is the condition of the bells themselves? Has there been any need to actually refurbish those bells. I noticed in the picture with uh, Edmund James, they were a nice, uh, beautiful, clean bronze uh, color, but, and now they're, they're patina with their green um, patina, but has there been any talk about the bells themselves needing to be refurbished? Um, no. So after a bell is founded, um, that's it. It's not, doesn't need any more adjustments um, unless it's a, uh, hung in an area that's affected by acid rain, um, significant air pollution, or the tower that holds the bells um, goes up in flames. Those are the three reasons why a bell would be destroyed or need to be adjusted. Um, so no, the Altgeld chime bells, they don't need any work, um, but I will say that the bells ha have never been properly tuned. Um, so the McShane Bell Foundry Company, they approximated the tuning of bells when they would found them. So, you know, they would just say, okay, if it's got a diameter of X inches, it's a D bell. Um, and they wouldn't actually do the, the complicated process of carefully tuning a bell. So the, the Altgeld chimes are technically untuned bells. So if you wanted to make them sound perfectly tuned, you would have to do some work, but there is uh, no taking some metal off of them, right? To tune them. Yeah, you would shave metal off from the inside 
on a lathe. You would, you know, spin it real fast and shave some metal off. But there is no desire to do that. Okay. Uh, we do have a question here. Uh, oh, and, and Mark Smith says the D the D sharp is noticeably yes. flat. <laughs> yep. And the E bell is noticeably sharp. Okay. Um, um, Patricia asked, how are chime masters chosen? So it's a, it's a little difficult. There's, there were a lot of different methods. So at first in the twenties, the chime was admit, you know, the, um, it was maintained from an administrative standpoint by Albert Austin Harding of the band. So it was actually owned by the band in a way uh, for the first few years. And so you had to audition uh, and be judged by Director Harding. Um, so there was a, a very formal process back then. It broke down by the late 20s, early 30s, and it sort of devolved into a you know, master apprentice system where there'd be someone who knew a lot about it and some student would just show up in, uh, in the history and he would be the assistant and then would take over as that other student graduated. Not really sure um, how you would get involved then. I think you just had to be lucky, right place, right time situation. Um, and then with under Albert Marion and Sue Wood, it was a semi-formal process in which you had to ask, you had to show some dedication, but if, if you showed that you wanted to play it, that was it, you could play. Well, and schedule just, you. Just as a follow-up, uh, Barbara also asked, does a chime player need to have a background in music? Uh, so for the longest time, basically from Albert Marion's tenure, so from 1958 until now, no background necessary. It's desire. You just, you just have to want to do it um, and you have to be motivated to play. Wonderful. Well, um, Keep those questions coming if you have them while we're waiting on some other ones. Let me see if I've got anything on Facebook. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, real quickly, many of you that have been involved with the museum know the name Sue Wood for a totally other reason. Sue was the longtime uh, board member here at the Champaign County History Museum and was also our co-president um, in the early 19-teens and uh, was really instrumental in keeping the museum uh, together. She would go play the chimes for her noon concert and then come and spend the afternoon at the museum, really holding the organization together for a number of years, at the same time battling uh, cancer. And uh, I was remarking to Liam, she had um, carpal, carpal tunnel surgery on both wrists, obviously from playing such a heavy and in, in, uh, instrument, but, uh, Sue has another, you know, she's, she's dear to us as well for the work that she's put in at the Champaign County History Museum. Uh, let's see, Michael asked, um, I can bring yeah, up. Yeah, so. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, my, Michael mentioned that I forgot to, Michael pointed out that I forgot to mention that um, nowadays, ever since Sue retired and the School of Music took formal ownership over the chime, the process of being chimes master is much more standardized. Um, you must be a graduate student in the School of Music um, and you are appointed by um, the School of Music um, and you report to the director. Um, and so now uh, Michael is the assistant chimes master. Um, he was nominated by Tina Horton, the current chimes master to take over when she leaves. Um, and then he will do the same when it is his turn to leave campus. Michael, would you like to pop in and say hello. I, you said that you'd be willing to, to, uh, to briefly talk about that. Real quick, while we're doing that, uh, Barbara asked one more question. What were some of the ways the senior classes raised money in 1914 through 1919? What were some of their activities that they undertook? Yeah, so um, this is, this is uh, quite a fun question because uh, it has some really interesting answers. Um, it was mostly done through drives where members of this committee, they would you know, set up a booth somewhere on campus and they would just start hounding people on the street as they walked to their classes. They'd go, you're a senior. Have you, have you paid your memorial dues yet? You know? Um, so there was a lot of uh, 
trying to squeeze money out of people. Um, they found it very difficult, very, very, very difficult to do that um, because you were essentially asking a senior in college to fork over, you know, $70 of today's money towards a project that they really won't see until well after they've graduated. Um, so there, were, there was a lot of difficulty, um, a lot of threats. Some of the committees threatened to publish the names of those students who did not uh, contribute their dues. Um, other committees in other years, they threatened to do a door-by-door -door canvas after uh, obtaining the address records of every single student from the university. There was, a, there was quite the aggressive campaigns. Uh, and then um, in 1918, particularly, uh, the classes would solicit alumni from previous years that didn't donate. They'd say, hey, we know that you didn't pay your dues in 1915. Like, you want to pay them now? Um, so it was a pretty aggressive fundraising campaign. I actually think that senior gifts should be something that still happens. I, I wish that that actually were still a thing at the U of I. So real quick, Michael, would you like to jump in and I can add you to the spotlight? Would you like to just say a, a thing or two as as a, another player? Yeah, yeah, sure. And um, real quick, yeah, Liam, excellent job with the history. It's always so fascinating to learn like the politics behind everything, especially. Um, yeah, so I'm the assistant Chimes Master, about to be the Chimes Master through the renovation periods. And uh, Liam pretty much hit everything on the head. Uh, it is a little bit more specifically through the Department of Musicology at UIUC. So the last three, I guess the last two Chimes Masters, Jonathan, who's also here, I think, and Tina, and then myself, have will all have be musicology graduates students to some respect. And I don't know if that's a requirement necessarily, but I think that's just something. Uh, and I I don't think you really apply. It's just like you sort of get approached and like Liam said, sort of random time, right place, right time. And then they throw a contract your way and you, you know, you figure things out and you learn under the chimes master and you, uh, and it goes beyond learning the chimes. It goes into how to manage the organization, how to set up events, how to w run communications, all that type of stuff. But yeah. Yeah, right. chimes, chimes masters wear many hats. Since you're both on, you might have a question here. Uh, this is from Tom. Uh-oh, where did my uh, comments go? He asked, uh, do current chime masters select their own playlist or are the songs selected by the School of Music? Uh, no, no selection by the School of Music. Um, it's all, all player based and it always has been. Um, those who play the chime play what they want to hear or what they think others want to hear. There was uh, never a requirement for specific repertoire. Um, and so it's really interesting that throughout the ages, the typical music that you would hear from the chime was very different. You know, in the early days, all you would hear were church hymns. That was what the chimes players wanted to play back then. Um, the first chimes master revolutional, revolutionally said, you know what, on Wednesday nights, let's play popular music. You know, a crazy idea, right? To play popular music. Um, I'm kind of um, curious to hear what the response would have been the very first time they tried to play something, you know, from like Elvis or the Beatles or something like that. That probably would, as they got more popular, I'm guessing there may have been some pushback from some people that didn't find it appropriate to play that kind of music on the chime. Yeah, so, you know, since, since chimes players get to play what they want to hear and what they want to play, um, there have been instances where, you know, not the right song has been played at the right time. Like, um, I remember specifically someone accidentally played um, a anthem from a national anthem from China that was outdated, um, brought some offense to the Chinese students on campus at the time. So, you know, for example, we can't play outdated national anthems, not, not a good idea. Um, um, and there have been actually a, f a, a few requirements um, with music. Sue Wood famously required everyone to play something called the change ringing fragment, um, which is just, a, you know, I don't really know how to describe it. It was very difficult to memorize, which was how I played my music. I memorized everything. Um, 
but it was a bunch of musical scales, um, very typical of, of change ringing music on swinging bells. Um, and then we currently require everyone to play Hail to the Orange, the alma mater, at least once during every concert. Um, but yeah, music has been largely dependent on who's playing. We play anything from anything from church hymns all the way to Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. You know, whatever you want to hear, whatever you want to play. Well, that's awesome. Well, I don't have any additional questions on Facebook, and I don't have any that are pouring in here. We're just a few minutes. We got started a few minutes late, so we've, we've run a few minutes over. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you, Liam, uh, for coming to us all the way from Washington, D.C. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, what, an ex what an interesting topic to dive into. I'm glad you had something to keep you company during the pandemic. Um, I want to thank Tom Kuypers, our museum manager, for, for reaching out to you and, and bringing you uh, here to speak with us today. But a really terrific presentation. Again, um, if you'd like to support the Champaign County History Museum, uh, you can go to our website, champaigncountyhistory.org slash support. You can sign up for membership or give a one-time donation. Those things all help us as a purely volunteer and member-driven organization to help put these kinds of programs on. And we're looking forward to ramping back up and bringing you a whole new slate of history talks uh, in 2021. So with that, we'll go ahead and end today. But uh, once again, thank you all. Give uh, Liam a virtual uh, 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 round of applause. And thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Take care. Thank everybody. you. Anytime.